Thank you. Welcome, guys. Good morning. Oh, I love the response. That's so great. Um, such a full house. Everybody likes to eat, right? Yeah, I can tell it's going to be a good group. Um, I was saying you guys have so many other great breakout options, and you guys were like, no, food. Let's talk about food. Let's talk about food. We could organize our lives, but or we could talk about food for 50 minutes. That sounds great. Um, I always love this quote. Um, because I agree with it wholeheartedly, right? People that like to eat are the best people. How many of you guys are foodies? Or you love to eat even if you wouldn't call yourself a foodie? Some people, some people love, hate that word foodie. Um, but you love to try new restaurants? Anybody like to try new restaurants? Okay. Anybody like to cook at home? Home cooks? Love it. Beautiful. So we're going to be talking about food for the next 50 minutes. Um, and I will give you a little outline. My clicker's very slow this morning, guys. So I will talk about who I am. Again, my name is Jessica Baumgart. Um, I started Delicious Denver Food Tours coming up on two years ago. Um, I'll talk about kind of my trajectory with food and into launching a food tour. We'll talk about what a food tour is for people who are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history and evolution of the Denver food scene. So we find ourselves in a world-class food city, right? And it's pretty new that we are getting all of this attention, awards, brand new restaurants opening up in town. How many of you guys feel a little overwhelmed sometimes by how many new restaurants there are? Like, can't keep up, yeah. You're reading 5280, you're reading the Denver Post or 303 and you're like, I have never heard of any of these restaurants. Um, you're not alone. I sometimes feel like that and I eat professionally for a living, right? <laughs> This is all I do all day long. This is more than just a food baby. This is a baby baby. <laughs> I'm expecting my first in, uh, in December. So new food tour guide on board. She's trying a lot of good food in Denver as well. Um, but we'll talk about kind of how Denver has cemented itself as a world-class food city and kind of where we came from and why we think that's happening. I'll talk about some trends that we're seeing right now in the Denver food scene. And then we're going to talk hidden gems. So restaurants that we love with Delicious Denver Food Tours, how we work with those restaurants, how we find them, and how you can find these great hidden gems as well. I will say at the top, this is not an exhaustive list of all the hidden gems in Denver. So I'm going to throw out some great options. You can write them down if you'd like. Um, but certainly if you have that great neighborhood place that you love that you've been going to for 20 years and it's not on this list, don't feel bad. There are hundreds of amazing places to eat across our city, okay? Um, so a little bit about me, like she said, um, I used to work as a private chef and cooking class instructor. So I taught private cooking classes for many years. Um, I would go to people's homes and teach them how to cook in their kitchens. It was a lot of fun. Um, I did that here in Denver and I also did that in Chicago where I lived before. That's where I met my husband, Nate. You can see him there. Um, we realized pretty early on in our relationship that we shared a love for food and travel. Travel was a big thing for us. Um, and we talked about we could, you know, work our traditional careers, we could retire, and then we could go travel, or we could just do it now. Um, so we decided to just do it now. So right after we got married, we took what we called like the world's longest honeymoon. Um, we sold everything we owned, we gave away, donated the rest. Uh, we quit our jobs and we left and traveled for a year. Um, so we spent almost 13 months, um, four months traveling through South America, two months through Southern Africa, three months in Europe, and then the last four months of the year in Southeast Asia, Ch China, and Japan. Um, and we did some really traditional travel things like we hiked the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu and we did a safari in South Africa and we uh, saw the temples of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, like the bucket list checked items. But what we really realized the longer we traveled was we loved food. <laughs> so we found ourselves seeking out food experiences everywhere we went as a way to really explore a place and discover the culture there. Um, we started to feel bad about it and then we were just like, you know what, maybe we're just food people. <laughs> you know, if you give me a museum or like a world class restaurant, I'm going to probably go with the restaurant. <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of museums, but um, so we started doing market tours, coffee tours, vineyard visits and wine tastings, cooking classes, um, and especially food tours. 
So we did um, some coffee tastings in Ethiopia, Colombia, cooking classes in Peru, Thailand, Sicily, food tours in Singapore, um, Japan, all across Southeast Asia. Um, and we just found ourselves loving this idea of exploring a place through food. And we realized we really weren't alone. Um, so this idea of food tourism um, is very fast growing. It's one of the fastest growing sectors of travel and tourism right now. And it's defined as traveling for a taste of a place, okay? Um, they did a recent study, 88% of people said that gastronomy was a big part of an, uh, the identity of a place. How many of you guys travel this way? You like to scout out local food when you go places, yeah. I think food says a lot about a place, right? We can learn a lot. We can learn a lot of history um, about a food scene. I said that in Southeast Asia. We went from noodles, 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 then we hit Vietnam and all of a sudden we were eating really fresh French bread and baguettes. And obviously there's the history there that explains that food trend in the culinary scene. Um, so when we got to Colorado, I said I want to find a way to combine these three passions that I have, which are food, people, and travel. I said if there's a way to even combine two of the three, I'll be a pretty happy camper. Um, luckily, I've been able to, to combine all three in this business that I run, which is called Delicious Denver Food Tours. So I launched this in December of 2017, so we're coming up on two years. Um, here in Denver, who has done a food tour? A couple in the back. Where'd you do food tours? Denver. Denver. Oh, great. Perfect. San Francisco. San Francisco. Terrible food town. <laughs> Nothing good to eat. <laughs> Nothing good to eat in San Francisco. You've done a food tour? Vancouver. Vancouver. Ooh, Gastown? Yeah. Oh, that's a great food tour. Uh, Prague. Prague. Love it. Awesome. Who is like, what is a food tour? Yeah, that's okay. That's totally okay. Chances are you've probably done this as like self-guided on your own and you didn't even realize you were food touring. Uh, but a food tour, what I usually describe it as is a city tour that features local restaurants and chefs, okay? So our food tours are walking. Some food tours, you go on a bus, you go on a bike. I took a Vespa food tour um, in Vietnam, which was pretty exciting. Um, but ours are walking. We run three tours um, in Denver, two right downtown in Lodo, one in Rhino. So a lot of the hidden gems, the recommendations I'll throw out are concentrated downtown. Um, I will say that. Um, we walk over two to three hours between five and seven restaurants. So we'll visit five to seven locally owned awesome restaurants. We do tastings at each stop and we talk about the story behind that restaurant. The chef, what they're doing that's interesting, awards they might have won, um, and then of course we're eating a lot along the way. And then in between those tastings, we feature the city itself. So we talk about the history of Denver architecture, um, our tour that runs through Rhino, we talk a lot about beer, because we're walking through the brew district, the highest concentration of craft breweries in our city, and we talk about street art as well. Okay, so it's a great way to get a feel for the city itself through food. And we work with a number of different restaurants. Um, we feature the same restaurants on our tours. So right now we're partnering with about 20 to 25 restaurants. Our food tours that are running today downtown and in Rhino will visit about 18 of these spots um, over the course of the day. And so we are really looking for the locally owned spots. A lot of them are family owned. They've won awards or they're known for something that's, doing th something that's unique or special. Okay? And we work with each of these restaurants, we work with the owners, the chefs, and we say, what do you guys do that's really great? Tell me about your story. And sometimes our food tour guides will tell that story and sometimes the chef will come out or we'll take guests back into the kitchen and show them the ingredients up close. So the idea is to kind of have a, a more intimate, more engaging, behind the scenes food experience. We know you can go to any restaurant in Denver. You can walk in, you can order, you can eat, pay and leave. Uh, but the idea of the food tour is more of a curated experience and it's with usually a group of people that are similarly interested in trying a lot of food, okay? So you can see this is one of our restaurant partners, Butcher's Bistro, I'll talk about this. Um, the chef may come out and talk through what they're doing um, if they're available. So our goals as a food tour, number one is to create amazing food experiences for our guests. 
And I do say food experience, right? This is more than just eating. This is an experience. Um, two, we want to support locally owned and operated restaurants, OK? We know the restaurant scene is very tough. Um, a lot of restaurants open and close within the same year, right? The failure rate is really high for restaurants. Often their margins are ooh, um, and it's hard to make work. And these are locally owned spots, so they're not going to be the restaurants that have like the huge marketing budget. You're never going to see a commercial <laughs> on TV or a billboard for some of the restaurants that we're working with. But we like to be able to tell that story and bring them business to support them. And then finally, to just highlight the best and brightest of Denver. Okay. So luckily, we are in this amazing food town, right? We've got a lot of great places to eat and drink right now. My little clicker is not working. Oh, there we go. Historically, not always the case, right? A lot of the food scene in Denver right now is new. Um, a lot of people on my tours, I've heard us called a cow town. Have we heard that? Denver's a cow town, OK? Two meanings there. One, we're known for beef, which is true. <laughs> um, and historically, it has been very true. Two is like that secondary sort of derogatory meaning, which means there's not great places to eat, right? There's just, we were a cow town, didn't have a lot of ethnic food, weren't bringing home the big awards or attracting the big chefs, but all of that has changed. Um, historically speaking, I always like to point out I-25. How many of us took I-25 today to get here? Yeah? Huh? Tried. Tried? Oh, no. <laughs> Mine was pretty clear. I was like surprised. Usually it's a mess. Um, but I-25, guys, historically was one of the largest cattle drives um, from Texas up through Colorado and into Wyoming. This was how we moved cattle um, up from Texas and in. It was called the Goodnight Loving Trail, which I love that name. I think that's a great band name sometimes. Uh, but 1866 to 1890, this was how cattle was moved across the Great West. Um, so this is really our history. So when people say Cowtown, I'm like, yeah. we're And still to this day, you can see this very modern photo of the uh, Western Stock Show Parade happening right outside Union Station. This is still a big part of our identity and a big part of our culinary scene, too. We're high elevation. We're landlocked. We're not going to be known for our fresh seafood, right? Um, but we are known for world-class ranches. So we talk about that on our tours as well. Oh. Sorry about that, guys. One of the reasons, I'm going to manually, one of the reasons that we have seen this explosion of the Denver food scene is this right here, which is population, OK? So this is the Denver population. I love that it starts in 1860 at zero, like there were no people living out here. <laughs> we all know there were plenty of tribes in this area before Denver was settled in the late 1850s. Um, but for the sake of this graph, this is what I found. What I like about this is just this steep hike in the last 20 years here, from 1995 really on, this huge population explosion, right? We know Denver is one of the fastest growing cities in America. The last um, stat I read was over 1,000 people are moving downtown every month right now. That's a lot, right? This explains why we're always sitting in traffic. <laughs> and parking's harder, and the housing market's more expensive. And there are all these you know, downsides to this huge influx of new people. But one of the upsides is the Denver food scene. And we can absolutely point to this population explosion because it's brought eaters. It's bringing people that are moving in from these other big food cities that have the appetite, the desire, the disposable income um, for great food. And it's also bringing amazing chefs moving in and opening up new restaurants every day. So this article came out in Condé Nast, April of 2018. Denver is officially a food city. All my friends that lived in other cities emailed this to me, and I was like, yeah, duh. <laughs> I think by 2018, everyone working in the food industry in Denver, when this article came out, said, yeah, duh. <laughs> um, but it's nice to know that outside of the city, we are starting to really be recognized for our culinary scene. And this is something that is new to us. Um, so last year alone, 230 new restaurants opened their doors downtown. Before that, 220. Again, like I said, not all those restaurants will make it. Um, some will close, but a lot of new things happening in this city right now. Just under 12,000 restaurants total across the state. Um, so a lot of places to eat. I always tell people, 
you know, if you tried one of these restaurants at every meal, a new restaurant for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, take you over 10 years <laughs> to get through all the restaurants that we have going on um, in our state. And that wouldn't account for all the hundreds of new places that are opening up while you're working through this list. Um, so a lot of new places, about 75% of the restaurants in Colorado are locally owned, which is really cool. It's very high. We really like this local, this local um, experience. And about 10% of the whole labor force in our state is involved in the service industry in some way or another. Zagat, it's technically pronounced Zagat, but every time I say Zagat, people look at me like I'm crazy. So Zagat in 2017 ranked Denver as the fourth hottest food city in America. Anybody surprised by that? Yeah, right? I was like, we know that our food scene is pretty exciting, but fourth hottest in the country is pretty exciting. What do we think the top three are? Not New York, not Louisiana. That's a state. Not San Francisco, but in the same state. LA. LA. Austin. Chicago, I heard, and I heard the third. Austin. 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 Yeah. LA, number one. Chicago, Austin, number three. Denver, number four. Which is really, really <laughs> exciting that we are competing. We beat out New York. We're competing with some really huge traditional food scenes. Um, based on what's happening. Anybody see this show, Top Chef on Bravo? Yeah, the cooking competition show. This is every time I have the flu, I stay home and I just binge watch this show. <laughs> Very relaxing, um, but filmed right here in Colorado two seasons ago. So just a couple of summers ago, the whole cast and crew descended on Denver. They stayed in the Maven Hotel downtown, if anyone knows that, um, on the dairy block. They were filming all across Denver and across the state. This was really huge. The Convention and um, Visitors Bureau Visit Denver was very excited about um, Top Chef coming because it brought a lot of national and international attention to our food scene. And I think a lot of people watching the show were like, huh, they're <coughs> filming in Denver. Or they're filming in Colorado. Interesting. Um, they did some like kitschy mountain stuff. They did Rocky Mountain oysters and, you know, all the check the bucket list for people that think about Colorado food. Um, but they also just featured a lot of our local chefs and restaurants. So it was really cool to see. Um, the chef that runs Bar Dough in the Highlands was our like competitor from, from Denver. And when the show aired, we had like live watch parties at Bar Dough. So you could go to Bar Dough and almost like watching a, a you know, sports event or a football <laughs> game, we were all watching Top Chef <laughs> um, as, the, as that show aired. So that was pretty exciting. Um, bon Appetit every year announces uh, 50 nominated restaurants for their best new restaurants in the U.S. So they release this list of 50 restaurants. This is not just Colorado or the Southwest. This is across the U.S. Denver had three restaurants make that 50 list of nominated. Reunion Bread Co. is up in Rhino. That's in the source. The Wolf's Tailor. Anybody went to, been to Wolf's Tailor? Love it. Was it good? Great. Great. I have a reservation for Thursday. I'm very excited. Took me forever to get. <laughs> um, and Beckon, anybody been to Beckon in Rhino? This is a tiny little spot. It's right next to Call, Beckon and Call, um, owned by the same, same folks up in Rhino. But these three made the nominated list. Wolf's Taylor made the list of top 10 best new restaurants. It's according to Bon Appetit. Um, anytime these awards come out, it's impossible to get a reservation. <laughs> so I would say, let's all go to Wolf's Taylor. I want to I check it out. Um, Kelly Whitaker is the chef. He runs a couple of other spots um, around town in Boulder and in Denver. But great, great things to try out. And we are taking home James Beard Awards. If you're not familiar with the James Beard, this is like the Oscars for chefs <laughs> or the Super Bowl for chefs. This is a really big deal. Our chefs in Denver compete for the James Beard Best Chef of the Southwest Award. So they are going up against Austin chefs, Las Vegas chefs, a lot of really big food cities they're competing against. Can you guys recognize any of these faces? Jennifer Jasinski in the center right here. Anybody know these two gentlemen? So from the left, Alex Seidel runs Fruition Mercantile dining in provisions inside Union Station, and Chuck, we're gonna talk about his recent quick service, um, chicken spot, pretty cool. Jennifer Jasinski right here in the center runs Rioja, 
Bistro Vendome, Euclid Hall, Stoic and Genuine, and Ultrea. So she's a big restaurateur between Larimer Square and Union Station. We often see her running between those two. <laughs> Sometimes you see her downtown. Um, and then Lachlan McKinnon Patterson right here, he and his business partner business, um, Bobby Stuckey met at the French Laundry in California. This is a really world-renowned restaurant. Um, <laughs> they moved together to Boulder and they opened Frosca, which has won a number of awards. In the last couple of years have expanded down to Denver with Tavernetta um, on the train platform at Union Station. Amazing. Anybody been to Tavernetta? Yeah, in the back, a couple. Really good. Um, and they're about to open up a new concept too. So this is really exciting for us to see so many James Beard Award winners operating um, in our city. James Beard uh, Foundation does a tour every year called Taste America. Um, they usually pick 10 <coughs> top food cities and they'll do like a pop-up dinner um, one night of the year in each of these cities featuring their James Beard Award winning chefs. Next year in May, um, they're doing a four day food event here in Denver. So not only did Denver make the list of these top 10 food cities for a pop-up dinner, um, but we're getting like a four-day event in May of next year, which should be really exciting. So this is one trend that we're really seeing in Denver is the rise of food events, and not just like come and try some things, food festivals or farmer's markets. I'm talking about major food events that are choosing Denver. Slow Food Nations is another one. Has anyone ever been to this event? Yes. Um, so the slow food movement, guys, I always explain is like the opposite of fast food. So fast food, slow food. So it's this idea that celebrates farm to table, the farmer, sustainability, doing it the right way. This is a really big event that happens in the summer on Larimer Square. In the few weeks that lead up to slow food nations, you'll see huge snails all across downtown Denver. A lot of times they have no explanation. People are just Googling why are there large snails in downtown Denver. This is their way of marketing the Slow Food Nations event. Um, but Denver is the only city in the US to host this event. So it's a really big international food um, event and movement, and it comes to Denver every year. So this is a great opportunity to obviously try some delicious food, but educational talks um, from a lot of top chefs across the country and a lot of our big name chefs as well will come to this event. Another food trend we're seeing is local chefs expanding. This is really cool and obviously something we expect in a town that's booming when it comes to food, but anybody been to Chook? Yeah, a couple people. This like quick service is good. Yeah, um, it's like Pearl Street Wash Park area. Yep. So this is Alex Seidel, that James Beard award winning chef that runs Fruition and Mercantile, recently launched quick service chicken spot okay so this is really cool this is a trend we're seeing um it's great to get a, a less expensive meal still owned by the by a restaurant run by a james beard award-winning chef um, pizzeria locale is similar anybody eating at pizzeria locale yeah so this is lachlan mckinnon this is another james beard award-winning chef runs that um, chain as well <laughs> the denver art museum just announced a partnership with jen jasinski and her business partner beth so we're getting some amazing new food coming into the Denver Art Museum. That should be really exciting. Um, Sunday Vinyl is from the team behind Frosca and Tavernetta. They're about to open up this fall um, a wine bar on the platform at Denver's Union Station. Okay, so right downtown on Union Station's platform, Sunday Vinyl is going to be opening up um, and will be, I'm sure, amazing based on the team behind it. Um, Troy Gard, has anyone ever been to Garden Grace? Mr. Tuna, Tag, Tag Burger Bar, hashtag. <laughs> he runs a lot of restaurants um, across Denver, but he's about to open up a new food hall. Um, speaking of which, food halls are king in Denver, right? How many of you guys have been to a food hall in Denver? Yes, everyone's like, yes. Um, at least one. So we have so many food halls opening up. Every time we say, oh my gosh, I wonder if Denver can support yet another food hall, another one opens up. Um, so on here, a couple of unique things about these. The Denver Milk Market opened up um, pretty recently downtown on the Dairy Block, so about two blocks from Union Station. This one's a little bit unique in the sense that it is all different restaurant concepts under one roof, so traditional food hall, um, all run by the same chef, Frank Bonanno. Okay, so he runs Osteria Marco, 
um, a, number, a number of other restaurants um, around town. But that food hall is a little bit unique. Most of them are different concepts that sort of compete against each other under this one roof. So you can go to one spot and you can get a steak, pasta, pizza, bao, gelato, all in one place. Um, the Broadway market is, is that sort of concept. The Denver Central Market is that sort of concept. Um, the source is unique in the sense that it's hotel and marketplace. That one's up in Rhino, if you're not familiar. Zeppelin Station up in Rhino as well. The Stanley Marketplace, similar. Avanti is a little bit unique in the sense that it's a food incubator. So a lot of new restaurants will get started in Avanti. Or you'll see Avanti as a launching point for restaurants that are moving from like a food truck concept into a full brick and mortar restaurant. So it's a great place for them to test menus and to get started all under a com one commercial kitchen license, basic, basically. Ecclesia is in Castle Rock. So this one just opened up, um, I think in the last, uh, over the summer in Castle Rock, Tributary in Golden. So Denver proper is not the only one that's getting these food halls. They're cropping up everywhere. And then literally this week, um, a new one was just announced. It's going to be opening up in the spring of 2020 at I-25 in Colorado. Junction is what it's being called. This one's a little bit unique in the sense that it's being opened by real estate developers instead of chefs. Usually it's food people that get together and open up these food halls. But this one's a couple of real estate um, groups that were like, yeah, let's jump on this bandwagon um, of food halls. Another big trend that we're seeing here in Denver is we are home to second locations of major restaurants that start in other big food cities across the U.S. One example of this is Uchi. Has anyone been to Uchi? Yeah? It's great, right? So good. This was one of the most exciting restaurant openings in Denver last year or the year before. I can't remember if they opened right over the year line, but Uchi is in Rhino. Um, it is sushi Japanese. Tyson Cole is the James Beard award-winning chef that runs its original location in Austin. <laughs> so this was a really huge restaurant in Austin. They said, okay, we're looking to expand to our second location. We're looking at cities across the US. Denver's it, which is really exciting. Um, right above it, I always like to point out, is Altius. Um, this is a hydroponics tower farm. Um, a lot of people think it's a grow house, like marijuana's going up in there or something. <laughs> Um, but they are actually tower farming. So they have over 30,000 plants growing year round. It's all temperature controlled um, and they use less water because they're not land farming. They're supplying microgreens, um, edible flowers, all sorts of cool stuff to a lot of local chefs downtown right now. So Altius is another really cool. Altius, yeah, is the name, A-L-T-I-U-S, farms. <laughs> Safta is another second location that we got in the last couple of years. Anybody eaten at Safta? Yes, in the back, inside the source. Um, this is another really big chef that's based out of New Orleans. Um, went to expand his restaurant. So this is an Israeli Middle Eastern restaurant. Um, looking for a second location and said, Denver's it. Um, and opened up. It's delicious if you guys get a chance to go. So good. This in the bottom of the picture is um lamb hummus oh it's life-changing <laughs> so good if you like hummus it's the best hummus you'll ever have in your whole life um death and co love that name right such an uplifting name has anyone been to death and co oh okay so this is a craft cocktail bar so you got to be into the really fancy cocktails for sure their book their menu is like this big it's massive um, but they opened up in the last couple of years inside the Ramble Hotel, which was the first hotel in Rhino, little 50-room boutique hotel um, right off Larimer Street. Um, but Death & Co. started in Manhattan in 2006 and actually won the award for best cocktail bar in America. So they are the real deal. And again, when they said, all right, we're looking to open a second location, what city's going to get it? It was Denver. Now they're looking at it expanding to Chicago. Um, but if you're into like a really nice craft cocktail, this is one of those places where the menu is so huge and confusing that I just sit at the bar and say, you make me something <laughs> pre-pregnancy. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little hidden gems in Denver. So some of our favorite places to eat and why we like them. Um, Marco's Coal Fired Pizzeria. Who knows this spot? Anybody eaten at Marco's Coal Fired? Yeah. So they started in the ballpark. They've got a second location right around here. 
Um, locally owned and operated, family owned, the owners Mark and Christy opened in 2008 after studying the art of making authentic pizzas in Naples, Italy. Okay, so they brought that back. Um, they are certified by the AVPN. Does anyone know what the AVPN is? It's like this very, it's a very long Italian word. I call them the pizza police. <laughs> um, the AVPN is the governing body in Italy made up of all the old pizza families in Naples, they put their stamp of approval on truly authentic Neapolitan pizzerias. Okay, there are less than 90 AVPN certified pizzerias in the entire US. There are only two in Colorado and one is here in Denver. Okay, um, when they opened up, Mark, the owner imported water from Naples <laughs> to make his dough. Yeah, that was not sustainable. You cannot import that much water um, and stay profitable. Um, so he created a water treatment system and they are still pH balancing their water that they use in their pizza dough to make a truly authentic Neapolitan pizza. These guys come in every year and I always joke, these are the guys that come in and like check their cheese <laughs> to make sure they're following those really strict specifications. So I like them as a hidden gem because most people walk in, they order a pizza, like, man, that was a really good pizza. They pay, they leave, right? They never know, oh, you just ate at one of the only two AVPN certified uh, spots in Colorado. That has a great story as well. Butcher's Bistro, oh yes. It's in Colorado Springs, and I don't know the name of it. But if you Google AVPN, you can search by state, too. So that's something, too. If you really like Neapolitan pizzas and you're, like, traveling to Chicago, you can plug in Chicago, and it'll show you everyone and which ones are recertified every year. Yes? Did they have information? Were they from Naples at all? Or they just to... They're Italian-American, but they're not from originally from Naples, but their family is from Italy. Yeah. Um, Butcher's Bistro. Anybody been to Butcher's Bistro? One. She's, are you really? Yes. Like as of this talk or you were doing it? I love it. I love it. So good. This one is a real hidden gem. It is really off the beaten path. So this one's in the ballpark neighborhood as well. Only one location. It's on Larimer Street, like going into the dodgy area of Larimer, like away from Union Station. Um, the owner, Scott Bauer, came from Snooze. So that was kind of how he started his um, restaurant career. He's been working in kitchens since he was 14. Um, but opened up Butcher's Bistro in 2014. And these guys are a nose to tail butcher concept and restaurant. So both a butcher case and a sit down restaurant. They have won the award many years for best steak in Denver. Although I will always say not a traditional steakhouse in the sense that you can go and order any cut of steak you want. If you go to dinner at 6 p.m. and you order a steak, the cut will be different than if you order the steak off the menu at 9 p.m. the same night. The reason for that is they are working through the animal, <laughs> right? They are getting in whole animals every week, week and a half from their Colorado ranchers that they work very closely with and they are breaking down the animals in house. So it's a great steak spot. They also serve some of those interesting bits of the animals that we don't always see on menus like pig head and beef heart and yummy stuff. Lambing season is always big for them. They'll do a lot of lamb. <laughs> Um, but a really great spot, and they're doing it the right way, using every part of the animal to honor the animal that, they're, um, that, that we're eating. And they're sourced all locally from Colorado ranchers, which I like. I had a group on my tour from um, Georgia that called it, instead of nose to tail, they, they called it snooter to tutor. <laughs> the chef loved it. The chef was like, I'm printing that on a shirt. We're now snooter to tutor. <laughs> Cracked me up. But this idea of using every part of the animal. And that goes back to Cowtown, right? We are known for our world-class ranches, for sure. So I always love a, a restaurant that's going to showcase them well. Butcher's Bistro, you can also get Rocky Mountain Oysters. They won't call them that. They just call them what they are on their menu because they're actual butchers. So they're not like sugarcoating it, calling it Rocky Mountain Oysters. Um, Lazo Empanadas. Anybody know this little shop? tiny little shop. Um, they're about to open a second. They started in the ballpark neighborhood. They're about to open a second location on 16th Street. Two brothers, Argentinian brothers from Buenos Aires, came up to Colorado with the plan to just stay for a couple of years. Of course, one married a Colorado native, so they're here forever. Um, but opened Lasso Empanadas. In 2017, when they opened, 5280 named them one of the best new restaurants in Denver. 
which is really cool. We talk about the white tablecloths, the farm to tables, the really high end places that you're gonna you know, have to book two months in advance. But there are some amazing hidden gems in Denver. You can get a baked, authentic Argentinian empanada. They make them from scratch for 350 here. <laughs> really, really delicious, so I love them. Super Mega Bien. Anyone been to Super Mega Bien? Does anyone know work in class? Yeah, work in class. Dana Rodriguez is the chef there um, in Rhino, right across the street, so inside the Ramble Hotel near Death & Co. So if you're looking for like an awesome date night, do a cocktail at Death & Co. and then go to dinner at Super Mega Bien. Um, but these guys are really great because they're doing Latin dim sum. So traditional dim sum service, you're going to sit at a big communal table. They're going to come around with carts with all these little plates off of them. You order whatever you want, um, grab things and go, but all Latin food. So really great ceviche, really good sangria. It's like my favorite sangria in Denver. And I think I've tried it all for research purposes, <laughs> pre-pregnancy again. Um, Liberati is another great hidden gem. Anybody know Liberati? Okay, this, this one opened really in the last year, so they're still under one year old. But these guys opened in Curtis Park, Five Points area, um, in this big old building that's very colorfully painted right now, but it used to house for 80 years a printing press. Um, perfect for craft brewers, right? So they are brewing beers. The owner, Alex Liberati, brought from Rome his executive chef, his bread maker, his brewer. So the whole team is, has come with him from Rome to open up this spot, Liberati. And what they're really known for is their Eno beers. Anyone know what an Eno beer is? They've kind of coined this term. But this is a craft beer made with up to 49% wine grapes. So this is like a beer and a wine had a baby, and it was delicious. <laughs> Um, on their menu, they have all the breakdowns of the grapes that are involved in each brew um, and what percentage. So some of them taste like, oh, this tastes like a really good craft beer with like a longer wine finish. Some of them taste like, wow, this is like a wine with a little bit of craft beer on the side. Um, but really interesting, they've got a very traditional um, Osteria style menu. So from scratch, Italian food. Marta, the executive chef, does all their fresh pasta. Um, they're curing meats in-house. They do gelato from scratch, cheese from scratch, and then obviously all their bread um, is made from scratch as well. So Liberati is another great place to hang or to check out. And then Cho 77. Anyone know Chalone or Chalone? Yes, a couple people. So this is this like French Asian fusion spot. They are really known for their French onion soup dumplings. Oh my gosh. So amazing. Um, Chalone is one of those maybe special occasion meals. Could, get, could take you a little bit more time to get a reservation in. But Cho 77 is the same chef, the same owners. Um, they just moved from Broadway up downtown in the last couple of years. So they're right off the 16th Street Mall. And you can go in, you can get a reservation, or you don't need a reservation. Um, it's not quick service, but it's much more casual. You can get their soup dumplings, really delicious menu at Cho 77. High tide poke. Who's eaten poke? Yeah. This is like originally from Hawaii. It means to cut up. That's all poke means. But poke is like sweeping the nation. I feel like poke is everywhere opening up right now. There is a lot of bad poke in Denver. Okay. Again, landlocked state. We're not necessarily known for our fresh seafood, but I know a lot of people like to eat seafood and they want to know where to get great seafood. Um, in Denver, so I always focus on high tide. They're chef owned, so you'll often see the chef slash owner in the restaurant, which always makes a big difference, um, just having that oversight. Um, and they source fish from Seattle Fish Company, which despite the name is local <laughs> to Denver. Um, so they can get fish six to seven days a week and they get the whole fish in and cut it up. Um, a lot of poke places will get like pre-cubed, frozen, fish and then they'll thaw it and serve it to you and it's just never good. Um, but I always like them because they're doing it the right way. So how do you find all of these places? Um, obviously you can read the food bloggers, right? 5280 is a great source for recommendations for new restaurants. Um, even if you don't subscribe, the top of the town is a good um, issue to get or the top 25 restaurants in Denver. Um, 303 food, same thing. Uh, West, Westward, I think Westward 
is more um, open to giving a bad review. So you might get you know, the positive and the negative as opposed to just the, the glowing eat here um, review. One thing I will say about the food bloggers in Denver is, or, or these you know, traditional print um, journalists, is they're gonna feature the new restaurants. Okay, so these, this is a great source of recommendations for what, you know, Wolf's Taylor, all these new things, new awards that are coming out. They're not necessarily going to feature an amazing, like, taco place that's been operating for 30 plus years um, where nothing's really changed, right? Which also might be worth checking out and interested. Um, interesting. Ask the service staff. This is something I always do. If I eat it somewhere really good, I always ask my server or the bartender, where do you eat when you're not working? Or where do you drink when you get off work, <laughs> right? Service people know how to eat. <laughs> they usually know. And the service industry in Denver is very small. So a lot of times, people will switch from restaurant to restaurant. You know, the GMs and servers that we see on our food tours will switch restaurants. And all of a sudden, they'll be at a new restaurant that we go to. And we're like, oh, you used to work at this other restaurant. Um, so they know each other. And they know um, the owners and managers. Um, and can, can really tell you if a place is treating their people right, which I think makes a really big difference uh, on whether or not you're going to get a good dining experience. Look for local. That's another thing I do. Not every restaurant is going to say up front, hey, we're locally owned, or hey, we're locally owned and operated. Um, a pretty easy way to do that is if you're on their website making a reservation, and it says locations, and then you see like 10 other cities, probably not local. <laughs> Might have started in Denver and then expanded to those 10 other cities, um, but probably going to be a chain. For sure. Do you like Eater? I do. Yes. Eater Denver is another really good source to use. Yeah. And you can follow these on Facebook too and just like, you know, kind of see the highlights in your feed if you're, if you're on Facebook. Um, review sites. So Yelp, TripAdvisor, Open Table, all these places where you might go to read reviews on restaurants, like peer reviews. Um, I always say just take with a grain of salt because people are crazy, right? Sometimes people are crazy. Um, sometimes you get a really good, you know, you're getting the balance. But I find mostly with the Yelps, you're going to get people that were either really, really happy or really, really unhappy. <laughs> Most people are not in between saying, oh, that was a pretty good dinner. That was a good dinner. I'm going to go home and, like, write a detailed review for someone else. Um, yes? Yeah, I don't listen to those as much, but that would be a good option as well, for sure. Yeah, if you have the time or you're, you know, driving in and out of work. Uh, there are a couple podcasts as well um, that will cover restaurants in Denver. Um, another thing about review sites is we're seeing this kind of rise in influencers, which are people that say, I will post an Instagram photo of your restaurant for free food. <laughs> Um, so a lot of times reviews are from those people, and so I just tend to trust them less because you're not, you're not someone who's just walking in and paying for the food and getting an actual dining experience. You're getting this, it's almost like a restaurant critic. It's not going to get the same uh, dining experience if the restaurant knows they're coming in. Yeah. How do you avoid those? How do you know if you just reach them and them? You can't. Yeah, you can't. That's the hard part. So with those review sites, I just... I might, like, if I want to go to a new restaurant, I might look at Yelp or TripAdvisor and other review sites, but it's never going to be the make or break for me to try a new place. Um, also because not everyone agrees on what's good, right? I think online, because it's anonymous, we kind of assume people are like us reviewing, whereas if somebody recommended it to you in person, you might be like, I don't know if we eat at the same places, or I don't know, you know? Everyone just has a different idea of what they expect. Sometimes you can see that from the review. It's like someone ranting about some crazy thing. Remember that it doesn't have to be expensive to be good. Um, so we have up here, these are the Navajo tacos at Kachina um, on the dairy block. That's inside the Maven Hotel. I love those tacos. Yum. Navajo fry bread all day. Um, Biker Gyms. Anyone know Biker Gyms? Gourmet hot dogs? Yeah. These guys were voted top 10 hot dog joints in the U.S. Um, and they're right here in Denver. Um, Jim Pittenger is their owner, started as a food cart and went on to open gourmet hot dog spot. You can get those hot dogs at Coors Field, Broncos games now, um, Red Rocks. So you're starting to see them over and over. High Point Creamery, they have a couple of locations, but one is inside the Denver Central Market. Food and Wine named them one of the best new ice creameries in the country when they opened. Um, and then right down here we have Zo Mama. That is an awesome northern Chinese street food spot. 
started on Pearl Street up in Boulder, and now their, um, their second location in Denver is right off Union Station's platform as well. But all of these places, you can get a really great meal for under 10 bucks. <coughs> and then finally, take a food tour. <laughs> Come on a food tour. We'll show you lots of different places. Um, you can find us at deliciousdenverfoodtours.com. We've got a little promo code if you ever want to come. Check us out. This is a good way to try, again, five, six, seven restaurants all in a three-hour span. So if you live outside of downtown and you're like, yeah, I could drive an hour in to go to one restaurant, um, or you could drive in and go to seven restaurants or six restaurants, um, that's a great way to just have a curated experience for you. And then finally, if you're looking for other recommendations, we have um, our Insider's Guide to Denver Dining. So this is on our website. So this is also at deliciousdenverfoodtours.com. On the home page, if you scroll down, you put in your email, it's free. We'll send you a little neighborhood guide. So these are all of our favorite places to eat, drink, and be merry in the Mile High City, broken down by neighborhood. And many of the spots that I highlighted in today's talk are in that as well. That's what that looks like, the Insider's Guide to Denver Dining.